Good morning, everyone. So glad that you are here today. Such a, what a rich time in worship. Um, I, I needed that. I don't know about you. Um, sometimes it's a struggle to get to church. Anybody struggle to get to church sometimes? Yeah? Was it today? <laughs> um, I struggle to get to church today. I try to get here this morning. I'm usually in here pretty early, and uh, my car is still broken down at my house. So, uh, but I'm here. Amen. And I believe God has something for us uh, today. It's, it's, we're in week two today of our series, um, When in Romans. And we are walking through uh, the book of Romans, which is a, 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 a big book uh, by the New Testament standards. It's 16 chapters. And so we're going to be in the book of Romans for a little bit of time. And this has been labeled like Paul's most influential letter. It's been labeled almost the fifth gospel by some people because it's that uh, pivotal, that impactful of a text. And we're going to be digging into this uh, pretty ex- 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 extensively and uh, not quite going verse by verse, but almost. And so we are, we're walking through every single section of this, even the difficult ones. And I believe if we listen to this and we're receptive to what God is kind of speaking through his word, then I believe it's going to help, un, uh, help us understand it's going to illuminate the gospel in an even greater way for those of you who are followers of Jesus, for those of you who are exploring or seeking, it, I think it's going to reveal uh, who God is and I think it, in a, maybe a, hopefully a fresh way for you uh, because I believe it's that powerful, that, pack, that impactful uh, to us. And so last week we talked about Paul's kind of opening statement. He, he kind of set Romans up because he kind of had this background and really explaining the law. He was using it kind of like an argument, not really like to argue with one another, but, but in, a, in a legal sense, like I'm laying the case for Jesus. I'm laying down who Jesus is and why you should believe in him. And this letter was being sent to house churches throughout uh, the, the Roman a- area. And so uh, this is, we, last week we talked about very powerful verses like, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus, for it's the power of God for anyone who believes. Today, however, he gets into this idea of we need to talk. Has anybody ever had the we need to talk conversation yeah, it's never good when someone says we need to talk, is it? It's never like we need to talk, we're going to Disney World. That's never it, right? It's we need to talk and, and, and it always happens where we need to talk is followed by some sort of like, brace, okay, what's, what's going on? What's happening? And so Paul is about to have this we need to talk conversation with all of us, with all of us. Because this next section of Romans that we're going to look at today is his sit-down convo with them. It centers around the division that's happening uh, between Gentile and Jewish followers of Jesus. There was a culture clash in the church with a lot of dirty laundry that needed to be aired. And so Paul is about to air it out. In essence, Paul in this portion says, take a seat. It's about to get uncomfortable and I think that, you know, I'm so, another reason why I'm so grateful because, you know, the, for that time of worship, even today, is that we need that because sometimes we're going to get into a heavy topic and it's going to be like, okay, God, you are, you are speaking in all these areas. And understand that even when the gospel or even when the word is a word of correction or, or, or trying to clarify things or trying to address certain issues, it's never with the intent of talking about how bad you are, how you don't have it, how like and you're trying to beat you down. It's really trying to bring you out of something and really trying to help restore you. It's trying to build you up. But sometimes in order for us to grow stronger, to to elevate, to grow in our faith, we need to call some things out. That's what Paul's doing here. So he says, take a seat. It's about to get uncomfortable. And the topic at first is truth suppression. Truth suppression. Now, truth suppression is when somebody chooses to deny or avoid the truth, even when there is evidence that it's true. All right? It comes in several forms. 
The first form I want to address is denialism. Denialism. Denialism is when we deny reality to avoid, to avoid uncomfortable truth. We can deny reality to avoid. We probably can see some, you know, examples of that. The glove doesn't fit is an example of that, right? There's reality there, but we're just we're not accepting that reality because we don't want to avoid, right? I, uh, there, uh, you know, I have a problem with uh, uh, with Starbucks, but I don't believe it. But my son thinks I go there too much. You go to Starbucks every day, Dad. No, I don't go to every day. But, you know, I get your point. I'm denying a truth to avoid a comfortable reality that I probably shouldn't go there as much. That's trivial. That's not, you know, that's, that's little, right? But we have some bigger things. Denialism, it happens a lot. It happens a lot. Watch out for it. Selectivism, it happens just as much. The acceptance of some aspects of truth while suppressing the more important aspect of truth. We will accept a, some of it, but we will, we will avoid the biggest truth out there. Like so, and this happens versus selective hearing versus selective telling. I thought about it this way. How many people love to hear the truth when it's hard about themselves? Nobody, right? How many people love to tell the truth to somebody else? That's hard. We, a little bit easier, right? Now, I know that we don't like confrontation, but we like telling versus hearing the hard truths, right? Now, also comes into selective listenings or selective hearing, right? It's selective reading, engaging on whatever criteria supports our feelings, and then saying, hey, this is the truth. I'm going to avoid all that because this lines up with what I feel. It's the misinformation versus disinformation argument. The, the misinformation or the false facts, right? It's inaccurate. It's getting facts wrong. Or the disinformation is really being deliberately intended to mislead people, intentionally try, misstating the facts so that you could, you know, like, lead people down a different path. So denialism, selectivism, personal gratification. This one's huge. This is a truth suppression tactic. Right? I don't know if you've exercised this. I've exercised this in my past. Personal gratification where we exalt one's own desires, thinking, pursuits in life above all else. To get what we want. To get our desires satisfied. To experience pleasures when we want. To get ahead. To be comfortable. To be right. To fulfill our version of success. This is the conversation that Paul starts this we need to talk portion of this letter. So we're going to go there now. It's Romans chapter 1, verse 18. He says this, God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, sinful wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For God, uh, for ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God has made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature, so they have no excuse for knowing God. He's talking about natural revelation. This idea that anybody anywhere can see can tell that there is an intelligent designer, that there is a that there's a creator who is above all. If you just look at creation and the sky and the earth, and you can see that God, that something was behind it, someone was behind this. It was obvious, Paul says. And this idea comes uh, is, is is laid out again in the book of Psalms, chapter 19, verse 1, it says, The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or a word. Their voice is never heard. Yet, their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. God had made a home in the heavens for the sun. It was, it's this, this heavens proclaiming the gospel. So, so, so Paul's saying it's obvious. 
It's obvious that there is a, there is a God and we should know who God is just by natural revelation. So he goes on in verse 21 says, yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him. So who are they? Who are they? So Paul is kind of given this retelling uh, of, of, of the beginning of what we see in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 3, verse gen, chapter 11. He's referring, saying, hey, these are people who are, who are out in the world. They're, they're Gentile-ish people, right? They're not. And so they're saying, hey, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give thanks to him. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. And as a result, their minds became dark and confused Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. Instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. Here's another form of truth suppression. It's substitutionalism. We suppress the truth when we exchange the objective truth for, uh, you know, for the wor- of the word of God in this case for the subjective truth of our own emotions and experience. There's an exchange that happens. Like, I'm just going to substitute this. And so there we go. When we choose to do this, those emotions, those experiences will become our God. Or our feelings will, will, will emote something and we will create something that we can worship and serve instead. It's a claim to be wise. But it's really foolishness. And what happens when foolishness sets in we make bad decisions, right? When, fool, when we are foolish, we, when we think we're wise but we're really foolish, what happens is we make bad decisions. We make bad trade-offs. Now, there have been bad trades throughout history. There have been bad economic trades, right? Enron, uh, Morgan Stanley's subprime mortgages, right? It's Robert Citron. There's been a lot of, of economic trade, you know, bad trades, people got in trouble for. There have been some epic bad sports trades as well. Babe Ruth comes to mind, right? Hunt, Babe Ruth, if you don't know this, Babe Ruth was traded from the Boston Red Sox to the New York Yankees for $100,000 and a $300,000 loan to finance the musical No No Nanette. Now, nobody really knows Babe Ruth as a Red Sox, other than, you know, the really diehard Red Sox fans. They know him as a Yankee, because as a Yankee, he became one of the greatest players of all time. Same is true for the St. Louis Hawks traded Bill Russell from St. Louis Hawks, which nobody knows, to the Boston Celtics, where he went on to be the winningest NBA player of all time. 11, 11 NBA titles. The Cowboys traded Herschel Walker in the late 1980s for 12 draft picks. Because everybody, nobody could stop Herschel Walker, but he was getting older. So they said, you know what, we're going to do this. And it paved the way for Dallas to win three out of four Super Bowls in the 90s. Point is, when we think we are wise, but we are really foolish, we make bad trades. And Paul, in, the, in here, he's about to lay out some bad trade-offs that we do spiritually when we, when we think we are wise, but somehow we, we think we know God, they, we know what's better, but we end up being foolish So he says in verse 24, God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their heart desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. There's a bad trade happening. There there was the objective truth about God that you could see. It was obvious to them. But they traded it. For a lie. They wor- so they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the Creator Himself who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. Amen. All right. That was a test. You guys passed. Good job. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, Burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men, and as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. It's a tough passage, right? Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never 
be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness. So when we see in verse 18 that God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, Paul in verse 29 starts to list out the wicked things that they do. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning and they disobey their parents. It's interesting that disobedience of parents is in that list, right? I think it's, I think it makes, you know, it should highlight how big of a deal that is, right? They refuse to understand. They break their promises. They're heartless and they have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worst yet, they encourage others to do them too. That's a, that's a big list. What happens when God abandons you? Does, the question that, you know, sometimes we ask ourselves or we ask out, you know, other people, does, does God get angry? And I think... We see in this passage that there's a, Paul would answer that question, yes. He shows his anger from heaven in this way. Like I said, he's retelling this idea from Genesis 3 through 11, specifically more like Genesis 6, the beginning part of Genesis 6, where we see what is happening in the world and then we get the account of Noah and, we, and, and, and so forth. But he's showing how the Gentiles would have uh, would become trapped in a spiral of sin and selfishness. How the human heart and mind are, are broken. They've, they've turned away from God to embrace idolatry, to finding ultimate significance in the created things and giving allegiance to those things that are not God. They're worshipped created things, not the creator. Right? This resulted in a distortion of humanity and destruction, destructive behavior. What is left is, is humanity that stands guilty before a holy and just and righteous God. And this is what Paul is trying to put, lay out. He's trying to lay the groundwork for how he's going to describe this righteousness, this holiness of God, and how none of us are worthy to be saved, yet we have been saved anyway. Because the righteousness is a rich, rich word that describes God's character. It means that God is always just. It's always right. He acts in such a way that is just and right. And God is faithful to fulfill his promises. Now, I'm going to pause for a second because there's been a long history of evangelical Christians who have used the passage that we just read to condemn different groups of people in our culture, in our world. And they basically have said, because of that, these terrible tragedies have occurred. There have been condemnation of different subsets of people in our world and saying, you know what, because of that, of this lifestyle, because of this wickedness, earthquakes happen. They were blamed for earthquakes. They have been blamed for mass animal deaths. They've been blamed for terror attacks. They've been blamed for floods, fires, and definitely hurricanes. I'm sorry about that. And while I believe that repentance is, a, is something that we should, as believers, exercise, we should be mindful of, we should consistently exercise, because none of us are perfect, right? We should be repentant, and we should repentance. I believe that attacking subsets of, of people in no way shows the love of God nor ingratiates them to the cause of Christ. I believe it hurts, it taints our testimony, our witness. I believe it turns people away from God rather than taking a step towards trusting him. So there is some division, even in our church, even in our day, in the big C church. 
Because there's people who will take that and start blaming everybody and say, hey, you caused this, you caused this. And my whole point is, what? Don't you want to see them come to, come to faith? If, the, the, you know, let's, we got to have a real talk. And sometimes we need to talk, but that's not, that's not really what's being said here. So misrepresenting God and spreading disinformation about God's will is something I'm not going to engage in. I presume like Paul, to know nothing except for Jesus and him crucified Amen. and raised from the dead. Amen. What I will say is that when we trade the truth of God, about God for a lie and God lets us exercise our free will, we, like the people in Genesis chapter 3 through 11 and so forth and so many today, become trapped in a spiral of sin and selfishness. We become trapped in that, right? Our mind and heart are, are, are broken. There's this distortion. Confusion is pervasive. And the thing about confusion is when you are confused, you are seldom the one that recognizes it, right? You believe you are clear-minded. When you are confused, when your mind has been darkened, you believe you're clear-minded. You believe that you are right. And when we are confused, we turn away from God and we embrace things like idolatry. We find ultimate significance in created things rather than the creator. And we give allegiance to those things rather than to God. And it results in a distortion of humanity and destructive behaviors, leaving a humanity that stands guilty before a holy and righteous God. God's desire is never to leave you nor forsake you, but he won't believe for you. You have to decide to make him part of your life and to live your life in devotion to him. And to this, Paul, Paul's fellow Israelites are like, might respond like, whoa, I am so glad I'm not one of those people. I'm so glad that I'm part of this tribe, I'm part of this group. I'm God's chosen people from among the nations. He has, got, he has chosen our people. And Paul says, not so fast. He goes on in chapter 2, he says that you may think that you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad. And you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked, I mean the Gentiles are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge others do the very same things. And we know that God in his justice will punish anyone who does such things. So since you judge others for doing these things, who do you think who do you think you can why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? He says, you're just as guilty. You do the same thing. He's highlighting both to both audiences that neither audience, neither group has the moral high ground here. We're all sinners. Additionally, he's addressing the topic that, of personal choice versus God's tolerance. Like, hey, you have free will. You can do all these things, but why? Who do you think you are that you can do this thing and God's not going to care about it? Do you think you could avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? And he says in verse 4 that don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Wow. Wow. Kindness is intended to turn us from our sin. But because you are stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin, you are storing up terrible punishment for yourself. Sometimes we wear this kind of badge of stubborn entrenchment, like it's a matter of honor or pride, like I'm set, I'm there, nothing is budging me, nothing is moving me, I'm doing this thing. Maybe even like in this passage we're going, you know what, I'm so glad I'm part of this group of people because we are, we are right. I am right. I don't have to change anything. And this stubborn refusal to change course is just something that we can sometimes just find ourselves entrenched in. 
and staying stubbornly entrenched in your sin is storing up, Paul says, a terrible punishment for you. Refusal of repentance is not helping you escape judgment. God is righteous and just. There's just, there's just no way there's no way around it. In fact, in, in James chapter 4, um, he, James illuminates this. He says, don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. It's your job to obey the law, not to judge whether or not it applies to you. God alone who gave the law is the judge. He alone has the power to save or destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor? And he goes on. He says God alone is the judge. He's got the power to save or destroy. And he says that it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. So God alone is the judge. And so it goes on in verse 6. Uh, he says this, he says, a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will judge everyone according to what they've done. He will give eternal life to those who keep on doing good, seeking after the glory and honor and immortality that God offers. But he will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for themselves, who refuse to obey the truth and instead live lives of wickedness. There will be trouble and calamity for everyone who keeps on doing what is evil, for the Jew first and also for the Gentile. But there will be glory and honor and peace from God for all who do good, for the Jew first and also for the Gentile, for God does not show favoritism. This is a tough pass, tough section today. It's very, Paul is saying, man, there's a lot of stuff we've got to talk about. Because what was happening was there's so much division uh, in the church and people, and there were Jewish people, followers of Jesus, and there were Gentile followers of Jesus, and there was all kinds of kind of culture, you know, stuff behind them that they're bringing to the surface. And not the matter, not the, you know, not the least of which was what was happening in real time where the church at that point was made up of mostly Gentilish believers because the Jews had been expelled from the city of Rome. And now they're coming back to finding, oh man, we got a little bit of an issue on our hands. And Paul's saying, hey, I'm going to nip this in the bud right here. Yeah, all are messed up. All of us. We don't have the moral high ground here. Neither of you have the moral high ground here. And he can say that, Paul can, uh, for a number of different reasons. But the least of which is that Paul was not only a Jewish Pharisee by, you know, by brought, being brought up that way, but he was also a Roman citizen. So he, has, he, was, he was kind of in both camps and had, and I think that's why God was like, I'm going to use this man right here to spread my gospel throughout the Mediterranean rim because he's going to be able to be able to proclaim the gospel of Jesus to all people at that time. So, so, so Paul is just saying, hey, God's judgment is coming. We can't think that we're going to avoid it. But sometimes we think, we take that, even that, that verse that we read just a little bit ago, that, that for the day of anger is coming and God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will judge everyone according to what they've done. We look at that. We talk about giving account for our sins and giving account for all. Sometimes it's about like, okay, God, I'm fearful. Like, what have I done? And how am I going to have to do that? I'm not going to get into that. I don't know. I don't know how exactly that's going to happen. Here's what I do know. Sometimes we specifically think about actions and specific things versus where Paul talks about, hey, this is what we need to avoid. If we want to avoid, if we want to have glory and honor and peace from God, we should avoid living for ourselves. That's not, that's pretty broad. Refusal to obey the truth. So why are we refusing to obey the truth? Is it denialism? Is it selectivism? Is it substitutionalism? Is it personal gratification? What is it? But whatever it is, if we live for ourselves, if we continue just to live for ourselves, we said, you know what, forget it, I'm going to live for myself, and we refuse to obey the truth, which has been made obvious to us for whatever reason, and instead we live lives of wickedness, which he just put a long list of what constitutes that. Those are the things. It's not like, oh, man, God's mad at me for that one thing I did 10 years ago, and I'm never going to be able to get past that. God, God can't get past what, I'm think, what I thought about last night. 
That's not, that's not what it is. God's saying, hey, if you continue to do this, if you continue, if you are refusing to repent, refusing to obey, if you continue to live lives of wickedness, this is the warning. This is coming down the path. But that's not what the way it should be, nor should we feel confined to the, be like, okay, I did something. I can't get out of it. Because God's kindness is intended to turn us from our sin. He's wonderfully kind, incredibly patient, and tolerant with us. And it's his kindness that leads to repentance. So Paul is trying to say, hey, this is coming. I got to give you the, 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 the truth on both sides here. I got to give you the hard truth that here's where you guys are leading to, where you're heading. But there's a way out. He says, when the Gentiles sin, in verse 12, they'll be destroyed even though they had never had God's written law. And the Jews who do have God's law will be judged by that law when they fail to obey it. Verse 13, for merely listening to the law doesn't make us right with God. It's obeying the law that makes us right in his sight. Even Gentiles who do not have God's written law show, here's another part of just kind of the the, the, uh, the, the obvious nature that there is a God and that we should be able to know and ask those discerning questions. If Gentiles, even though they do not have God's written law, show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it. They de demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts for their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them they are doing right. Have you ever had that happen? Yeah. We have it happen, happen all the time. Right? We call it our conscience. And somehow we are informed, our conscience is informed, or our spirit is informed by saying, hey, there's something imprinted on our heart. It's written in our hearts because our own conscience, our own thoughts from time after time, day after day, many times a day, either tell us, hey, you're doing it right, or hey, this is a little bit wrong. And we know it. We know it. And this is the message I proclaim, that the day is coming when God, through Christ Jesus, will judge everyone's secret life. There is a lot here. So God wants us to To live for him, but he won't force his will on us. And that's, that's awesome. Because we can sit there and we can go, okay, God, I'm going to freely live my life according to you. I understand that, there is, that, that you exist, and how can I know God more? We, talk, we sang about that today. We talk about all that all the time. That's one of the reasons why we want to plug in is so that we can know him more. Not just information, but transformation that God is doing something in our lives. We're able to know who God is and how he's actively working in our life. That happens by being here. It happens with you know, encouraging one another like we talked about last week. It happens in life groups. It happens all the way, all throughout many things that we do. But the objective is how can we know him? How can we live according to him? It's not, the cool thing is we don't just have natural revelation. It's great. Like it should open us up. If we go out in nature and we're like, man, that is so amazing. Isn't creation beautiful? And how could that even possibly, like this is just, there has to be something here. That's where it starts. The other cool thing is that we have divine revelation. That now we have even more of a, of a standing be like, okay, who is God? What is he like? What can, how can we know him and live our lives according to him? And so the, 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 the danger is can we, can we push aside or can we can get past any kind of the stubborn entrenchment that we might put ourselves in and say, you know what? There are areas of my life where I need to say, you know what? I'm not, I'm not that's not it. I'm not living according to the to the truth. So today, as we kind of close, our worship team is going to kind of come up. He wants our undivided devotion. God wants our undivided devotion. It's, that's not unreasonable. 
So we got to live this out practically. How do we live it out practically? And I think, I think we, we should ask ourselves, is what I'm doing intended to only serve me? Or are my desires God-honoring? Are they self-serving or are they God-honoring? Am I suppressing the truth of God due to a personal choice? Am I living in disobedience because of selective feelings that I don't want to give up? Am I judging others when I'm guilty of doing the same kinds of things as they are? Am I being insistently stubborn in my refusal to repent? These are challenging questions. They are very much introspective things that we need to kind of go before God and say. And you know, you know, because that last verse that we read says it. Like, you know, there's something imprinted on your heart. And you, you, the, your thoughts, your conscience either accuse you of doing wrong or they tell you you're doing right. So you know, you know. So here's my, here's my takeaways. And this is kind of the, the we, we had the, the, the hard part. Here's what I want to encourage you with. God made everything so we can clearly see his invisible qualities. And they draw us closer to him. And they help us know him better. Because of that, we can look to him, we can trust him, we can count on him. That's one. Number two, we've talked about it many times already today. God's kindness is intended to turn us from our sin. He is patient. He's wonderfully kind. He's tolerant. Repentance is not a bad thing. It's not a shameful thing. It's a restorative thing. Right? We feel shame when our conscience and our thoughts accuse us of doing wrong. Instinctively, we feel shame. But repentance is not meant to be a shameful thing. It's meant to be a restorative thing. It's meant to be a good thing. Okay? Listening only doesn't make us right with God. It's the, through obedience to his word that we are made right in his sight. So the encouragement today is just lean in to the wonderfully kind, incredibly patient and tolerant father that you have in heaven. Don't be afraid to repent. Lean into to knowing him and then saying, okay, I'm going to, I, I want to live my life according to his truth versus my refusal to obey those things because of whatever reason that you may have. So as we go back into a time of, of worship, our prayer teams are going to be up here. They're here to pray with you. They're here to just kind of seek God with you. We can, I, I, if you're in your seats, if you're coming up here, whatever you want to do. But let's really press into what God is doing. And then maybe it's a time for repentance. Maybe it's a time for you to say, God, I repent of, and you know what it is. You know what it is. I'm going to leave us with this in Psalm 19, and then we'll pray. It says, the instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. And the commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true. Each one is fair. They are more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the comb. And they are a warning to your servant, a great reward for those who obey them. So obedience to his ways revived the soul. They are trustworthy. They are clear. They are pure. They are true. They're sweet. And they help guide and direct our lives. So, Father, thank you for giving us.